Do you have it? Does everybody, can everybody either see it on? Is it on Dropbox? Yeah. There's a different one. This edition is good. Is it? Which edition is that? Pacifica. Wow. It looks like one of those, is that print on order? I think it is. Yeah. Ah. That's a Yes. Okay. Just I'm trying to just string this up a tiny bit so that we can have Tia show up and be showing up. Um, so while I'm going to bring up Telegama. I mean, as most people know, because we talked about it last week, uh, this book was written technically, supposedly, um, to help um, the students, well, actually to help the, um, the um, people teaching it, which I think is great, um, you know, how, to deal with, how to deal with metaphysics. So the first question I have for you, given the Kantian suggestions that we're, that we're just now putting our toe into, what do you think metaphysics means? Because obviously that word, that term, that concept is bandied about so much to the point of trying to get rid of it, to, to embrace it, to expand it, to do something with it. Um, and that a number of people's work, myself included, have for many, many years fought against metaphysics, fought against the whole concept of metaphysics, and tried to fight against it from inside the, the belly of the animal, so inside philosophy. Now that has brought with a number of issues, a number of problems, not the least of which um, is rethinking what is metaphysics from my perspective, uh, and whether or not one means it as a generic term to identify a systematic way of thinking about logics that affect culture and knowledge, that that's a form, that's a thing called metaphysics. Um, that's the first thing. The second is whether or not, hello, hello, I thought we had the, the London contingent, contingent. <laughs> opened up with a question uh, of what people are thinking the word, the concept, the term of metaphysics actually means. Because I think if we're going to pull it apart, if we're going to try and think our way through it or out of it or something else, we at least have to know what is considered the problem. So what is considered the problem? What What is this thing about metaphysics? Is it a sort of a science of the unquantifiable, of the, that that you can't experience? Okay, so why is it called metaphysics? Um, because it goes um, sort of above. So that's that's the that's the lay yeah. sense of it. So the notion of physics. Let's start with physics. Physics is about what? Um, it's like in the green sense. sense. Science, that action. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a sense of physics? Should one actually worry about the term physics and the term metaphysics? Is it possible we can not Oh, no, because we can't have that. No, 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 because then we can use that. It's just that this rope is. Oh, sorry. I'm seeing Dane in this kind of like very interesting way. <laughs> yeah, it's better. Um, should one think about the word physics when you're thinking about the word metaphysics? Should that be called into mind? Is it, I wonder if it's a distraction. Is it, because I just think of physics in school. So like, so phys that, that, what I'm trying to say is that the science called physics, mm. uh, what is the advantage or the disadvantage to then call something a metaphysics? Because obviously the word physics is in the word metaphysics, so it, it is linked. But how is it linked, and what what is what is the relationship between, let's say, physics and chemistry? Is there a relationship? Okay, okay. People are going to have to have a lot of coffee before they can send them. Okay. Well, I think chemistry is more. 
online um, experiments and they still try to spin it to something that it's called the world. Okay. You can't use the word in the definition. Okay. So it, could, it could be something related with, uh, it's something that you can prove, it's about experience. And metaphysics is uh, something that that's where you cannot prove if it's true or not. But you really can't prove a lot of things in physics. Like, for example, you can't prove the fact that the Earth is exponentially expanding and shrinking at the same time. Yeah, that's true. You can't prove that yet, although that's a very strong position in physics that Einstein called. He put it under these things that he couldn't prove. Uh, he put them under the category called the fudge factors. He just had to take them on as a given in order to, to say, OK, well, you know, OK, OK, you can now speak. <laughs> Physics fuses with nature. Mm -hmm. so we started there. And um, this is just the etymology of the word, I think. And the word metaphysics comes from the organization of the nodes of Aristotle. Mm -hmm. That <coughs> uh, what we have of Aristotle mm -hmm. are is nodes for his courses, not things he published, like Plato, of which we only have what he published. Mm -hmm. Just the idea of publishing at that time period is really fabulous. <laughs> you just think of chiseled tablets, <laughs> papyrus, you know, go on. And um, his uh, scholars compiled his teaching, and uh, there was the book of physics about nature, describing nature, and he's actually, in touch here, he started introducing the idea of observation. Um, and then there was the book that came after the book of physics, after in Greek is meta, and spoke about absolute principles and eternal laws. And by extension, that then became metaphysics. Okay, I'm going to stop right there, so I just want people to think about this. So, in fact, at least in its early days, there really isn't a distinction as such between physics and metaphysics, and I want you to become very sensitive to that. I think we need to break the great divide that has happened in the 20th and 21st centuries around the division between knowledges. Um, the boring knowledges being the sciences, boring by which I mean, you know, uh, too tight, too logically, uh, you know, uh, sterile. That's a word I'm looking for. Uh, although, again, you could make the same argument around philosophy. But I digress. Um, so, the, so this is kind of important for you to get a sense of. Now, where has the word migrated to? Where has metaphysics, because nobody, except for a few people that are kind of slightly obsessed with this, certainly not today's world would actually think about the etymology of metaphysics. I mean, that's excellent what you just said. Uh, and, and realizing that it's linked to Aristotle, and so therefore realizing that when, it, when most people refer to themselves as metaphysicians, they are either unconsciously or otherwise accepting the Aristotelian principles, which are, which are without putting too fine a point on it, uh, considered on the one hand the foundation of philosophy, and on the other hand, uh, for those that don't agree with most of it, or any of it, uh, a bastardization of philosophy. Because there's the big divide between Plato and Aristotle. And, uh, and, of course, the Platonic laws and the Platonic move takes you in one direction, and the Aristotelian move takes you in another direction. Okay, so, now, now, so you get a set, I mean, they, they sometimes cross over, but you get a sense that you have these two different scenarios going on that sort of march side by side. Now, the second thing you should know about metaphysics, then, is where it's leapt to. So in, like, the 1700s, the, the, in sort of, like, the Renaissance time period, the, the, the way in which metaphysics is taking on its new clothes, you would say would be what? In what way is it different than, than the after book of physics? Well, it becomes beyond physics. Well, beyond physics. Um, and, and what does that mean? Well, it takes um, multiple uh, shapes, but what it does is that it creates two environments. One here, in space and time, uh, and that environment can be what we call experience in the lay terms, can 
can be the body, can be the provable science, it's proving um, it's history. And the other one is a model that is a real, which would have indeed the absolute principles that are embodied in the physical world, but also in terms of either um, abstract scientific laws or in terms to me, this is the problem I have mostly with it, of that which can save all. So language and reason, and more recent terms, uh, are associated with metaphysics because we, we have the impression both in, uh, in, uh, in normal life and in thought, in critical thought, that we can describe linguistically everything and totally, um, which is one of the main problems uh, in, in approaching art now, especially contemporary art. The art is about something, and you can describe that, that, that thing, art is about um, verbally. And all too often, what happens in the making is completely disregarded. Mm -hmm. so the metaphysical has taken over the physical. Mm -hmm. like it's, it's, it's just so and so forth. Does anybody have an, an, another way into that question? Kate, did you want to add anything to that? Mm. Um, <coughs> Well, that takes me into the Lacanian fascination of things that can't be described. Things that can't be described linguistically. Don't go there yet. Don't go there yet. Just, just the word metaphysics. Um, well, from my reading, I've got the Kantian definition, which is a priori synthetic knowledge. Is is metaphysics. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's that's what he says. Yes. Andre, did you were you gonna say something? Uh, I was well, I, I was looking that up and um, is it anything to do with the ontotheologic, theologic, so the Hegelian um, notion of God giving himself ground for the beginning of science, the beginning and end of science. So no matter. Mm -hmm. So this is we're now we're now teasing out uh, uh, one of the positions that Mattia raised which is the way in which one has all knowledge. And you're suggesting, by the way, I know you're doing this as a question because you're a young and, and vibrant thinker, but I'm going to ask you if it is possible to set aside any Englishness you might have in the deference way of presenting something and try not to be passive when you put it forward. So don't ask it as a question. If you think that you have a point, which is an excellent point, don't be afraid, don't be shy. You're, let's pretend we're in New York. <laughs> we just, just go to New York here. Just, that is such a good point, and I want you to, to own that point. Okay, so can you phrase it again, this time not as a question? <clears throat> right, so the... So what does Hegel do? Uh, Hegel, what, well, according to Heidegger, Hegel, posits um, God as the beginning and end of science. So the ontic grounds knowledge, yeah. and it's a theo theologic. Exactly. OK, good. Lauren? Hello. Um, I'm you can say it loud, because we haven't met our microphone yet. I was thinking there's a uh, problem with that, that approach. How we make a point, how we make a claim, like whether to what extent you're possessing, because that's where the issue of possession, dispossession comes in, in terms as well to this problematic of metaphysics as a um, claim, as possession rather than dispossession, I mean, the distinction. Is that yeah, that's interesting. So you're suggesting that metaphysics has something. To say about possessing. Yes, it's, right. it's, it's claiming. Um, and in, in terms of like account from my reading, he gives that example where he says um, from bodies, if you remove um, colors and like all aspects of, then you reduce it down to space. You can't remove space, he says. Then he says you can't remove time. So he's like still holding on to the void of time. Okay, good. So we're, we're getting warmer now. Um, we're getting fuller. I don't know, maybe that's not sure what the right expression is. 
So we've moved from this sort of generic sense, which was a correct sense, but it was still a bit generic, that metaphysics is the after, is the next book in a series of, you know, thrilling, you know, whodunits, uh, a book written by Aristotle, and that's book two. That becomes metaphysics. Then it takes on another life where it actually is speaking about something that it goes beyond the natural world. And what goes beyond the natural world starts to take on the clothes of reason. And that reason, the reason reason takes on the clothes of, of reason, is be, the reason that a certain form of logic, a certain form of intellectual logic takes on the next step is because one starts to displace God as the ontotheologic positioning of culture and starts to put reason as the way in which things happen. So if something can be reasoned, you can come up with a, with a series of ways of thinking it with a conclusion, and that conclusion will hold because one can set up a series of ways to think it through. There's a reasoned scenario. Now that level of reasoning, that way I've just explained it, has at least two aspects to it. One aspect is that which has an eternal law to it, or eternal positioning to it, an absolute positioning. And this is what I think you were referring to as, as kind of the, the a priori. Yes. And it's, it's a priori, but it's synthetic, because it's, it's produced through a reason. So the reasons, the reasoning, is able to produce, uh, or is able to uh, express, maybe produce is the wrong word, is able to express a, a way in which one can articulate the natural world and can change it. So it's both, both being able to see it and to be able to change it. And that, those, that ability to change something is resting not just in the hands of God, but in the hands of humans and God, because of the feature of reason. And reason exists as an a priori synthetic unity. Do I have, did I paraphrase you correctly? Um, now. <laughs> okay, but I basically said what you were trying to say. Okay, now Mattia, we'll go back to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. So now, given that this is the situation, and, and also picking up what Andre said about Hegel. What does Kant mean when he puts forward this notion of the a priori synthetic unity as a, as a way into talking about metaphysics? But he is losing the problem uh, of metaphysics having, having not having been questioned, being accepted as a dogma. Mm -hmm. for not being valued by the science, and for not being able to support any real knowledge because it hasn't been tested, it hasn't been analyzed. So he proposes a critical approach to it. And in the introduction to the protocol, um, he explains a bit more in detail what he means by um, analyzing, or better discussing briefly uh, the problem that Hume brought up. Um, Hume, who was writing in the middle of the 18th century, uh, <coughs> was a British empiricist who concentrated uh, on the fact that from the process of induction, that is, from details, one would put them together, associate more and more and more abstract, abstract laws that would apply to all of that. So it's a process of observing and then extracting more and more abstract information. Um, and, and, and you concentrated on the problem of cause-effect. And he concluded that no matter how much, um, how many examples we can have of a relation cause-effect, we cannot abstract to the point of saying that there is an absolute rule type of causality, cause-effect, uh, that exists somewhere else, per se. And okay, do, we, do people get this now? So this is going to be a very important way in to deal with both the rationalist and the empiricist that Mark so well uh, developed last week. So if you can't remember it, go back to last <coughs> week, filming of it, so you can, or actually read up on the relationship between the empiricist and the rationalist. So 
so go on. Yeah. And, um, and Kant says that uh, Jung was absolutely right in doing this, and his, his skeptical approach to, to the possibilities of knowledge is fundamental. Uh, but he so he didn't go far enough because he only addressed the ca causality and not the rest of the, the principles of reason. Um, and Mark last week was also saying that after you, the question of the existence of the subject and the nature of the reality that the subject would know and interact with was never put in question. But the, the fact that these two elements were there. And instead Kant starts to that. Um, so Kant moves from this this problem of Hume and says Hume was absolutely right. We cannot think that from the details we can reach an absolute, mm -hmm. a pure form of knowledge. A form of knowledge that then we can take and reapply to every detail when it happens next time. Okay. Um, with the problem, the modern interpretation of the problem of Hume is that from the past we can predict the future. We can yes, abstract way, scientific yes. laws. And the, 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 what Hume was saying in, in the treatise on human understanding, and you know, the, the very similar titles, I'm always going to confuse them. Um, it, there is a famous example where he's saying, I'm walking over a metal grid, and I see through it the void uh, below, and I am afraid of falling. And rationality tells you, don't be afraid of falling, because you know metal will always go up. And he says, well, I have known the metal to hold me up until today, but I have absolutely no proof that it will continue to do this in the future. So he calls it a rational jam, where one, if one thinks properly, the very rationality one is using turns against itself and disproves the expectation. Mm -hmm. And therefore he says, well, I cannot have the, the type of causality law that has a guarantee and a certainty to put back into actual time. And, and Kant sees this and says this is absolutely right. It needs to be this, this question needs to be applied to all the principles of, uh, of, uh, of reason. Mm -hmm. um, and here we are. And hence we have this. Now, questions so far, because now we're going to get much harder. So just to add one thing, then, okay. then the metaphysics we started from would be this pure principle of causality with no matter of absolute, if you like, not, no example. Here. We know that to each cause corresponds an effect. It's an empty formula to x follows y. We don't know what x and y values are. Mm -hmm. That would be metaphysics. Are you okay with that? Sure. Is that metaphysics before Kant? No, metaphysics with Kant onward. Okay. Yeah. Right. Like leading up to Kant, like leading right up to Kant. Yeah. The idea and Kant plays with that. Something pure. Uh, abstract, disembodied, but exists without a body, which is precisely the problem, if you like. And this is why Andre was so right in referring to the ontological uh, When we were reading Heidegger, he makes a difference between being with a capital B, a pure, infinite, infinite being, and then small beings, plural, with small being in place in time and space, in history. That they, they, all, they always need to refer to the infinity version, uh, which is nowhere to be found. So they, they constantly feed off each other mm -hmm. uh, in either uh, position. But in, in previous positions, there would have been being, 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 being the old man with a beard sitting on the throne, guaranteeing and holding everything up. Okay, are we, can we say that we've nailed that one on some level? So, just to be 100% certain, does anybody want to rephrase in a sentence or less, or two sentences or less, this this contemporary, by which I mean the Kantian move around metaphysics, so we can make sure that that's nailed in your heads and we move on? Anybody want to just give a summary? The pure abstract formula. Good, okay, and it's a pure abstract formula of what? Of anything. Of anything and that it will hold, and that the problem is, for Kant, it's not provable. So you have to come at it at a critical level. Th that you should not get rid of metaphysics, but that it needs to be, let's say, um, fine-tuned. And this becomes the problem, and it still is the problem today. There's one other level to it, uh, which is that in today's vernacular, 
you have this additional way of understanding metaphysics in two different, completely different ways. One is that it names the discipline called philosophy. So in some cases, if you see the word metaphysics, you are talking about philosophy, and by which that word philosophy is all things that come under the discipline called philosophy. That includes postmodernism, continental philosophy, it, it would include all sorts of um, positions around philosophy. So uh, that is not so-called getting out of metaphysics. The getting out of metaphysics, or the death of metaphysics, as some people write about, um, is suggesting that you cannot or should not uh, become uh, embodied in an environment, or not embodied, but, but uh, caught up in a, in a framework that allows for pure analysis without having something that will make it um, deal with corruption or corruptibility, fluid, sometimes not containable, these kind of things, uh, dirt. So Marx, for example, on one level is a metaphysician because he's dealing with philosophy and he's talking about a certain type of philosophy that puts history, or as he says, the dirt at the core of its way of thinking. But on the other hand, he's anti-metaphysics for precisely that reason. So he's a historical materialist. So when you start reading about these things called metaphysics, don't get confused. Or, or if you're going to get confused, know that the confusion is appropriate. Because some people employ that term to mean one thing. And some people employ it to, use, to mean another thing. And sometimes they use that interchangeably and are doing that in a way that is confusing. And that group in particular is speculative um, philosophy. It's doing that to a very large degree. And that's why it's quite an interesting thing to read, and it's also quite a frustrating thing to read. Um, but anyway, so this idea of, quote, getting out of metaphysics, what that's suggesting, there's also two ways of reading that. Let's say one way of reading the getting out of metaphysics is to, is to take on the challenge that was presented by Marx uh, and not just Marx, to add sensuality to the mix. Because metaphysics, whilst it can add many things, the one thing it can't do is it can't add the sensuous, or the one thing it's not able to do. So even though it proclaims that it can talk about everything, in fact, the one glaring thing it cannot talk about, except to abstract it, is the sensuous and the sexual, the erotic, these, these things which then get classified as the dirty, the you know, evil, or something wrong. Um, there, also, there's a, there's a collapsing of certain kinds of meaning, certain forms of meaning. So for example, there might be a way of talking about subjectivity, and subjectivity then bringing on the question of identity, and then identity getting into various forms of identities. But then, it's, then it sort of collapses into some sort of you know, mess. So once you get past uh, men and animals, and you divide it into, let's say, men, women, this is already a challenge for metaphysics. And then if you go even further and decide to divide it into hermaphrodites, transgender, gay, another tragedy, religion then becomes this whole other, becomes these all become add-ons. So, so the very thing that it was attempting to include in all one bag couldn't be included. Now the other thing about metaphysics that is, let's say, more complicated, is that there are those people who will agree that metaphysics means philosophy in the widest sense of the term, but that it still is going to be dead. It's still, we still need to get out of this. They're, they are going to make the argument that all disciplines have an end. That, that argument comes out of a, 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 a theorist named Fukuyama, who you may have come across. It's a great name. Um, and Fukuyama wrote in, I think it was, I think it was 1999 was the most famous one, but I, you'll have to Google it to be sure. It's, uh, it's basically where he calls for the end of all liberal ways of thinking. Not because he necessarily is in favor of it, but because he thinks they're ending. He thinks that all forms of liberalism will be ended. Philosophy, history, so it, there's a whole thing, the end of history, the end of, you know, um, the end of thinking, and this whole other thing is happening. There's quite a lot of people that agree 
or are talking about the end of metaphysics, and that's what they mean by that. They mean there's an ending to the discipline. Now, someone like Warhol, for example, uh, another artist, I mean, I'm just using him as a, as a kind of drop kick, uh, would, uh, would argue that art is dead, and that, there is, that, that the kind of art that one would normally call art before you guys and I, my guys and I guys came along would just, I mean, the kind of things that are in this room, for example, to a traditional discipline of art would simply not be considered art. It would just, they'd, they'd just like shake their head and cry. Um, because art tended to mean a technique, if it was painting or sculpture. Uh, later on, you know, there was the whole argument around ph photography and uh, and the you know and the machinery and so on and so forth. So there's a traditional notion of art that one could argue is now dead, or if it's not dead, it should be dead, or if it shouldn't be dead, you know, then you know every time you try and kill it, it's like one of those golfer things that just jumps up and you have to keep hitting it down. So. Metaphysics has a very similar life uh, parallel moment going on to this sense of art. So conceptual art, which most of you do, um, this, this form of conceptual art, which doesn't require or, or tries to get away from representation, tries to get away from the framing, all of that kind of thing, in, well, 50 years ago would absolutely not have been considered art. And 50 years ago, had someone announced there would be the end of art, what you're doing right now would be considered the end of art. There, this would not be considered art. Whatever it's considered, it's not art. And that's, you know, Warhol like, was one of the people who called for the end of art, because he said that, you know, in, in the end, everyone will be a designer and everyone will be a graphic artist, basically, a graphic designer, basically. That was, that was Warhol's position. You know, and a lot of people said, yes, but look at his work, it's really not art. You know, and on and on it goes. So it's having a similar life crisis. Some people are calling for the end of metaphysics in the same way that someone like Warhol or even Pollock was calling for the end of art, which meant that it's not like people would never be creative again. It's that the creativity would go in some other undisciplined, unfettered domain. So bear that also in mind. So you have these different sort of columns almost of how one can understand how this metaphysics, this playing with metaphysics has its issues. Does anybody have anything else to add to that particular part before we get into the polygon? Well, it's, this division of the matter and the physics is, 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 is sort of almost missed, overlooked by In Kant. Yes. yes. Um, because he um, so, that, so it, it seems like um, it's a mis misunderstanding of um, this, uh, what, what, misunderstanding of matter that um, is still saying not taking not taking the most um, because he sort of he wants to like still have his own pure right. So instead of Directing his question in, into um, how we think in, in a way that isn't a priori right, and is sensuous. So he moves off in this other direction on his way to try to find this other. Mm -hmm. That's true. But the thing I, I would caution all of us about I always come back to the Derridian move around deconstruction and Derrida's famous lament which was that the word, the concept of deconstruction, which he felt that he, if not invented, at least did the most to get it out in the open. Once it came, went across the pond, went to the US, deconstruction was no longer understood in the way he had intended it to be understood. It was understood as the way Americans had understood bad French, which was to take something apart. So the word deconstruction then metamorphosized to basically mean take apart something. So if you said, have a deconstructed apple pie, if you would watch MasterChef, you'll, you'll know this, uh, what you get on a plate is something all over the plate. That's considered a deconstructed apple pie. And that is not deconstruction. 
And so what Derrida said, I asked him about this, and he was quite funny, because he said, well, I have tried for so long to get people to understand that it doesn't mean take apart, it means build up. It means of construction, not against construction or apart from construction. So, and he said, I've now given up. I've now given up trying to argue this point, because every time I've argued it, people, it, it, it's like it doesn't happen. So now I've got to deal with the fact that the thing that I actually have built my entire work on is not at all understood because there's a bigger animal out there called American intellectuals that completely misread this one word, which became a central feature in universities and this and that. The same thing can be said about the word metaphysics. It is true that Kant does not actually look at the Aristotelian moment in, in, that, in the way that you're talking about in the division between meta and, and physics, and therefore he just sort of dives in with this, with this sort of later version of metaphysics. But he kind of has to, because that is how it is received. <clears throat> now, that's interesting for all of your work, because you're going to find that in all your work. When do you decide that something you're putting forward is the way it should be seen, and therefore you're critically assessing the landscape of whatever it is, A, or B, when does it not matter. You, you, you've shown conclusively that it should be this way, and yet it stubbornly remains over here. How does that change? It's, it's a problem. Like, for example, I can give you current examples, identity politics. How often in feminism, or in gay studies and so on, and black studies, and th these things, identity, black, gay, you know, uh, or even uh, Conchita, Conchita Wust, yes, she won, but she won as a she, she, you know, uh, this was a whole question around, it was an identity <coughs> politics thing. You could speak to the cows come home that identity politics doesn't matter, it shouldn't be a primary thing, you know. But it does matter, because it's still mattering. And it's still mattering for a number of different reasons, but it still matters. So that's kind of, so to bear that in mind whenever you're dealing with your, your kind of issues. No? <laughs> okay. No, I, 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 sorry, I, was, I was just thinking, well, he could have moved from the Leibniz more. He could have, but he didn't. Um, is, it, is it that more problem, or is it two sides of the problem, or two of the multiple horns? Because on one hand, on one hand, it is counterproductive to start every time from the beginning. Yes. Uh, because as we know, the examples you just gave, obviously things keep changing. So one cannot think of art as it was thought 3,000 years ago, because now we, 3,000 years of experience have gone by. Mm -hmm. And vice versa, at times one thing, it is happens to me very often, that I, that I thought of these already, I have sold it, I moved on, and yet nobody else did, or very few else did, yeah. therefore I still have to deal with yeah. the mass that yeah. is thinking in different terms. Yeah. So if it isn't the origin, but at least it is quite a few steps backward. Yeah. Has to but you have to be careful, because in your theses, for example, when you're writing your theses, um, chapter one is not meant to do the entire history of whatever has happened to whatever it is you're dealing with. So you don't want to go back to, like, the year one, you know, long ago and far away. I mean, you can tell, like, BA papers, often when they start talking about metaphysics, I get papers on the origin of Buddhism, on the origin of, you know, and it's like, no, it's just too far back, you know, uh, and so then if you, you say, well, uh, you want to, you don't even want to talk about it in terms of Western philosophy, because even that's like too far back. So you have to think about how not to what I call set the table. Setting the table is a problem of all young scholars, of which you are. Setting the table means when you want to introduce something, you go out and you buy the ingredients, you look at the silverware, you think of how to put it on the table, you have this entire discussion that leads up to eventually your dinner guests have died because they're waiting for the food and yet it doesn't appear. Page after page, you've gone through all the samples, you can find, don't do that, that's, that's what is generally called setting the table. Don't need to set the table in your theater. you need to set it in your in your, what's it called, the F9, the, the R9, the R9? Nine. Nine, Nine, Nine. 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 That's right. Yes, in a 9R, sorry. I don't remember the name of these things. Uh, anyway, uh, but in your actual write-up of your thesis, 
No. You have to take, you have to start somewhere, and this, you have to figure out, as part of a PhD student, you have to figure out where it is you start. Where does the start happen? And that's a tough one, and it's not self-evident. Uh, so you don't want to go too far back, and you don't want to go too far forward. So you just have to kind of figure out where it is. And so the same thing with Kant. In fact, obviously when he wrote his other works, he realized that people didn't get that, hence this work comes out. You know, and he's got another fantastic uh, sort of uh, edition for uh, children. In fact, uh, Leotard wrote Postmodernism for Children. I don't know if you ever come across this book. It's fantastic. It's really like, like someone speaking to you very clearly. <laughs> Here is what I mean by postmodernism. And, you know, of course, no one would read it because it's postmodernism for children, because they, obviously they felt insulted. You know? um, and then there's someone like Nietzsche who has the argument he won't do that um, because he calls it his PBS moment, Pearls Before Swine. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Gotta love Nietzsche. You know, so, and you all will have PBS moments. You, know, you will all stand up with a brilliant thing to say, and no one will get it. And not only will they not get it, they will maybe throw tomatoes at you or something, or well, they're, they're academics, they probably won't do that. They'll probably just write something bad on, you know, on Amazon or something. But uh, the same idea. It's a PBS moment. It's a pearls before swine. I say this with love to the pigs, but, you know, and I'm following Nietzsche. So everybody has their issues of how to deal with this kind of thing. Either you have to write a whole other work to predate your work so that people can then read your work. You might have that problem, or you have a problem of just trying to explain something you're just going to begin where you begin. And that's your PhD. Your PhD is you're going to begin where you're going to begin. You're not going to begin and then write the introduction to your PhD. I mean the introduction to your thesis, the, the thesis that you have. What is your thesis? What is the position that you want to put forward? The dissertation is the explaining of the thesis. But the thesis it's, and, the, the, and the research of the thesis is the setting of the table, which you don't need to tell your researchers about, or your examiners. Any questions on that? So that was a bit of a tangent, but I want you to get how is it, because the other problem that people have when writing PhD theses is that they often think, you know, it's so stupid that Leotard did X or that Deleuze did Y or, or Derrida forgot to put, you know, I'll just finish this off for him you know, for her, this kind of thing. And you can't do that because who knows why they left it out. Maybe they left it out because they had, were fed up with it and they just didn't want it in there. Maybe they left it out because it just wasn't their problem. And you can't blame them for not solving a problem that they didn't think was a problem. Okay, so that's the same thing with Leotard. Like uh, or Kant. Kant is always held up as the, the father, as it were, of enlightenment and also the father of racism or not the father, but let's say a supporter of racism. It's a problem, it's a real problem. And the question is, does his work lend itself to racism? Or is that just Kant being you know, awful? Okay, any other remarks at all before we get into the hard work? Yes? He hit the quotes in his mind. Yes. <laughs> but Hitler quote a lot of people. Can't, can't rely on, on that. Particularly, but, yeah. Well, which part of his work is seen as a little bit racist? Um, I don't know. Do you know? Well, as I was reading, I think he says it was his life. He actually mm. had. Um, it was like Jefferson had slaves. That, I don't know. That's a good question. There's a very nasty quote about Jews somewhere. Excellent. Like, Elimination of money. A group of money swindlers with no. To call their own, so uh, on. Yeah, okay, so that's, that's a good example of racism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> the, um, yeah, good point. <laughs> the, the, uh, this might put the shoes remembered by the uh, husband of Spivak, Gaya Pichatabot Spivak. Yeah. She wrote the critic of postmodernism. Yeah. Uh, of which I read some of the not maybe not the book, but. Um, and it made me think, it made me think that was taking from the title. Yeah. Um, and the references were that somehow the criticism was directed at the idea that these reason, these white European Western reason was taken as the reason only. And, and you know, all the other ways of thinking were considered as reasonable. Right. But that somehow is a non-criticism because it, 
it becomes some, so it's, it's like criticizing a kind of game because it doesn't apply the rules of another game. Uh, yes, I don't disagree with that. I, yeah, I uh, so I, but I'm not having read that book on the yeah, let's wait on Gayatri. Oh, Gayatri is an interesting character in, in herself. Um, now, the prolegomena. How do you say that word? Prolegomena. Prolegomena. Which literally means what must be said. There's something that one needs to deal with that makes this into a science. So I draw this to your attention because there is the move to legitimize philosophy, metaphysics, thinking by attaching it to science. And that is not an interesting. And you need to be aware of that move. Now, Foucault, in a later lecture, Called, uh, in, in fact, the book is entitled, uh, it's a series of his lectures to the Collège de France in, 17, in 1979, I think it was. Anyway, whatever. Um, he, the book was uh, Society Must Be Defended. I mean, it, he did a series of lectures, and this was the, the series in this one. And he asked the question, what do we gain by calling something a science? What is it that, that what, what, what you gain by, by having that word addressed to something as gentle or as complex or as nuanced as the sensuous as art? What do you gain? Not so much because you can think of a lot of things that you can lose. What do you gain by it? Is there anything that you can gain by it? And he begins to answer this question when you have to read the 200-page series of lectures. But you can read my very short version of it which is um, in Society Must Be Defended in Andalaki, small blurb. It's like three pages long. There's six pages long or something like that, for sure. Um, so you need to ask yourself that question. What is gained by thinking that this should be a science? It's not unrelated to the question, what is gained by an artist getting a PhD? What do you gain by that? I mean, it's taken me a long time to convince the powers that be that maybe people want a PhD in art not to go into teaching. That one of the, the zillions of reasons you could want, it's conceivable that a PhD is not necessarily the requirement that you are doing because you want to teach in the university. Would you agree with that? Why are you doing a PhD? Let, let's take it as read that it will allow you to teach in a university, okay? Why would you want a PhD besides that? Because you need to work something out. <laughs> okay, because you need to work something out. And what does a PhD imply? That you've worked it out. <laughs> like no one else has. Uh, well done. <laughs> yes, that's right. So not only that you need to work something out, but you work it out in a unique way. And that in so doing, what does it do to yourself, apart from give you a total nervous breakdown? What does it do to yourself? Like po positively. What, what's the positive what takeaway? What makes you an expert? In do you feel expert? In some way. Yeah? yeah. And what, what does that do? What, how come you're allowed to call yourself an expert? I don't say it because I have a PhD. <laughs> what, what, is it that, what is it that a PhD has given you? Rigor. Rigor. <laughs> yes, hopefully not mortis, just rigor. Uh, rigor in asking questions. Rigor in how to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Not what questions, but how to ask them. And that is the role of science. It's the same move that's going on. The move to link this, I mean, in its best clothes, in its best Sunday dress. The move to call something, to link something to science in, let's say, the best of all possible world, worlds, is the same move of wanting a PhD for reasons other than wanting to go teach. We were reached by a slow to a precise concept. Yes? Because by <laughs> defining science as the rigor on how to ask a question, 
might sound a bit tricky, as in, oh, you're not asking a question, you start making all these distinctions and precisations, so then what comes out is only an out packet answer, mm -hmm. because you have prepared your data in a certain way, and all the method in a certain way. And the, the between quotation real answer mm -hmm. is, is never there. Right. And that's what it gets. Yes, that's, that's the answer in the critique of the reason. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, let, I mean the critique of purism. Not purism. Um, let's just try and remember when you get lost, which you will in about five more minutes as soon as we go into the... I know what's wrong with me. It's like... Prolegomania. Prolegomania. Yeah. That's perfect. <laughs> I will help. Prolegomania. That's great. Prolegomania. I like that. Uh, yeah. You know You know the word S-I-A-N? Shaman. See, that's another word I can't pronounce. And I've had to practice that. The shaman. <laughs> it requires a total move. Okay, anyway. Um, here's what I'm just hoping that you can grasp at as whatever level you can grasp it at the moment, because you're going to get much more heavier now. Um, this PhD that you're after, this hunger, it will not be tamed once you have your PhD, if you've done it right. It will be unleashed. So the problem is, is that the world will come in and try and beat it out of you. They're always trying to beat it out of you. And they will continue to try even more so if it really is unique, what you're doing. Okay, so it's bad enough that you come up with something unique, but if you really come up with something unique, that is just so threatening. It's people don't even want to, they just break. So you must prepare yourself for this in like, <coughs> like I don't know, doing rituals, you know. Foucault gets into the whole question of how to care for the self when you are in this situation of learning. And it's very, he gets into this in um, the, uh, well, in the book called Care of the, Care, Care of the Self, where he talks about how you take daily constitutions, by which he doesn't mean going to the bathroom, he means like taking a walk, or making sure, this is a very Greek thing, making sure you have a certain routine that you follow, that you do something because you need to protect yourself once this curiosity really becomes alive. Just like when you're a child, the curiosity is alive, and you kind of rely on your parents or your guardians or whoever they are to protect you. And you know how great that can be, because sometimes the parents can't be as protective as they ought to be, or they go into some other world. I mean, the amount of people that actually have fantastic upbringings is very tiny. Okay? Now, everyone, I think, tries to give their kids a fantastic upbringing, but whether or not that is managed is another thing altogether. And some people don't try at all. Or if they think they're trying, they have some other, I don't know what's the matter with them. Okay, so you need to learn how to protect this curiosity that's going to unfold. And one way to do it is to do exercises, literally, like walk around the block, you know, go out to see Katy Perry. I mean, r really, it's, it's absolutely essential. You know, the other way, or an additional way, it's not like either or, but another way is allowing yourself to think hard thoughts. To allow, allow yourself like the right to think them. The, you know, don't go in there saying, I'm an idiot, I can't think of anything, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, an unworthy, you know, worm that, you know, somehow came across Kant. Try not to go there, because other people are going to go there on your behalf, so don't worry about it. Don't worry, there will always be someone who will try and beat it out of you. So don't let that also be you. And now we go into this book. Because what Kant is saying is the one thing that you can rely on, that exists in a way that you can call upon, is what he's calling the will. And it's very beautiful, actually, when you read it that way, when you get the, the, kind, of, uh, the kind of armor, as in amour, armor, you know, the, the, the body armor, the body suit, the way in which the will should not be broken. Just don't break that will. And in order not to break a will, 
your own will in particular, you need to be flexible. Now, there's different types of flexibility. There's the flexible where you compromise so much that you have lost who you are. That's too flexible. And in fact, in a certain sense, that's not really flexible at all. That's just being like a happiness fairy walking around and just not wanting anything to, to change. So there's an old saying in the Torah, in, in Judaism, that in order to learn, you must learn to be, you must learn to live like a tree, especially in a windstorm where the tree bends. Obviously, if the tree bends too far and breaks off, you know, didn't work. Okay, so you need to learn how to keep the wood inside you. You know, not to keep you know banging on about this metaphor, but you know, you need to know how to bend. Or the Tai Chi thing. If someone throws something at you, you need to know how to move with it and then throw it back. It's very important. You, and what Kant is going to begin to describe, what he's going to begin to build up, is this notion of the will as the vital sign of life. There is a saying in horse riding that if you break a horse once, you can ride it. If you break a horse twice, you killed it. What that means is that if you break a horse once, you can take a wild horse and you can put a saddle on this horse and get the horse to accept the saddle. That's called breaking the horse. And when they accept the saddle, if you've done it right, they will run like the wind. There's nothing more fabulous than being on a galloping horse in the countryside with timber wolves running with you. I've done this. They make this. I've been running this. Anyway. With me in Manhattan, my horse. Anyway, who died? But running, 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 running with the saddle and the wind and the you know snow at night and just it just it's just amazing. Then you must learn how to become this horse with the saddle on you because that's what you're doing. You're breaking yourself. If you get broken one more time, if they are hobbled, if you are beaten. If, you know, if like the horse that was beaten in front of Nietzsche, which made him run down and try and save it, if it happens to second time or more than one time, you kill the horse. You kill that horse inside you. That horse is the Kantian will. And you must learn how to ride it. You must learn how to be with it. You must nurture it. So, Try and remember that when you're reading this. He doesn't put that in in this way, but then that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try and make sure you access it, because he's talking about the vital will, this thing that exists as the fundamental aspect to any form of reason, to any form of thinking. So the fundamental thing that predates reason is the will. The fundamental a priori synthetic unity is the will. Now people got very ex exercised about this and very excited about it. So someone like Rousseau makes whole arguments around the general will of society and the particular wills. And, you know, and, and in fact, you have a living will. We still use this word will like this. And you have, uh, how many people have a will? I mean, a will not like your own will. Live. I mean, your own will once you die. Yeah. Two people, three people, four people, four and a half. It, like, if you died, sorry, I'm depressing. If you died today, if you walked outside and got run over, by the way, you know the director of Sugarman just died this morning? No. Yeah. Incredible, 36. Incredible. Anyway, side note. If you died, would your people that you love be able to access your stuff immediately? Yes? No? Yes? Okay, no? No? Yeah. Lauren? No. No. Believe me, there's more than you think. You know? So, no. I wrote one as an art piece. As an art piece. That's good. Would it hold up in court? Well, it has a stamp and everything. Like, it's not true. Like, no. Would it actually be before? Yeah. It, okay. Yes. No. No. I write one in an empty. 
Legally binding. <laughs> I gave it. I gave for my PC so far to someone. So someone has your will. I did. I yeah, well, yes, claim your property. Yeah. It's a random one. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm oh, yeah. in the middle of a PC somewhere. You can have my will. Um, yes, I can't tip you, but here is my will. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, you have my will. You can have my will. Now, I say this. We've lost Grace. <laughs> 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 because it is, it does seem morbid to discuss wills and also discuss funerals. Do you discuss any funerals? Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Well, yeah, I know. But I want to actually. Well, I was talking with my mom and I, she told me what she wants, which is scary. And, <laughs> and I, I said, well, I, I kind of want to be buried at Fort Ben and the tombstone in my home town because I like the cemetery. So I would like to be. Very simple. My mother. So, but you don't have a funeral planned. Oh, kind of. Yeah, yeah. I know what I want. The funeral. Does anybody else know what you want? Because it'd be yeah. kind of a drag if well, you died and didn't tell anybody. My mom and my boyfriend. Well, they should. Yeah. Okay, okay. We'll okay. It's, <laughs> We're it's making a, one. Happen. It's a, It's something that one needs to. I mean, I hate to tell you, but you need to think about it. If you, if there's anybody in your life that you want to give anything to, whatever it is, including something that doesn't seem like it is worth anything, like let's say your books or you know your bicycle or whatever it is, because the state will take everything and will then charge people on top of it the inheritance taxes. Now, even if you don't have any property, even if the property you have is like you know the bicycle or whatever it is, it's kind of amazing. I just want to mention this. Now, um, because of HIV and AIDS, in the 80s, when I was very, very much involved with the um, movement politics in the 80s and 90s, an entire community died. And it was incredible. We used to talk about funerals all the time. And we would plan them and how they would go. Die. <laughs> we'd plan them. And uh, you know, people had come up with some really amazing funerals. I just want you to know the funerals are for the living, you know, the parentheses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're into having like fun funerals, like think about it, because it's like a really good idea. I've, I've come up with songs I want, you know, I want a pine box, litter all over it, you know, um, like I've thought about all of this, you know. I'm not sure what I want to wear, but I don't want to be cremated. I thought about that as well. No, oh, I probably, because I might. I'm an organ donor. Yeah, me too. I'll be there not useful, so I'm, I'm, I kind of assume that I would be like just cycled meat lead. So I kind yeah. of think it's a bit of a bad that you show off your face like, with no eyes and no skin. Just skin grafting, maybe. They can yeah, no, I, I wasn't thinking of an open casket. But I, I was thinking, like, I'm an organ donor, and also when I die, my whole body's going to go to science. So, you know, so whatever's in that casket. <laughs> Probably like toys and I don't know, like old videos. <laughs> you know, something that weighs the same, but you know, like money. money. <laughs> <laughs> Bully on you, attack the thing. Anyway, let's go to this. Okay, um, think about it because one needs to understand what it is to talk about this a priori synthetic unity that exists after you die. So where does the will reside? This will that is in us all. So just now, if you can go um, to let's see, let's go. Pardon me. What would be the best thing? Yeah, let's let's start at the beginning, I guess. Let's start. Pardon me. Um, let's start on page sixteen. Prolegomena or? The prolegomena. Page 16 of the prolegomena, not page 16 of the introduction. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's it. There we go. Um, let's go to the, the part that says what really counts as cognition that leads to uh, metaphysics. Has anybody remembered what they've read? Or do we need to, should we actually speak about it? Yeah, okay, let's look at number two, section two. 
the type of cognition that alone can be called metaphysical. He makes a distinction between synthetic and analytic. So, um, Kate, you want to read the first paragraph of that? Of metaphysical code. Section 2, number 2. Okay, you might have a really bad translation. I've got a queen. <laughs> okay, how about Stuart? Because I think that your translation is going to be so complicated. Stuart, can you read that section 2 on the type of cognition? Yeah. Uh, so it's of the kind of cognition that's Okay, so yours is also different. That's hilarious. Okay, oh, that's right, fine. Sorry, yeah. That's all right. We'll, we'll try and follow it. I think the rest of it's fairly... Okay. Yeah, if we do one magnification of these on the screen, we can read that one. Okay, Stuart, can you read that? Yeah, I'll read from here. Okay. So, yeah. so, on the type of cognition that alone can be called metaphysical, A, on the distinction between synthetic and analytic judgment in general, metaphysical cognition must contain nothing but judgments and priori, as required by the distinguishing feature of its sources. But judgments may have no origin whatsoever. Sorry, that's wrong. <laughs> but judgments may have any origin whatsoever, or be constituted in whatever manner according to their logical form, and yet there is nonetheless a distinction between them according to their content, by dint of which they are either merely explicative and add nothing to the content of the cognition, or ampliative and augment the given cognition. The first may be called analytic judgments, the second synthetic. Okay. Does anybody remember what you just read? So which is which? Which is analytic? Which the, is the ones that are expected. That's analytic. Yeah. So an ana so that's good. So an, an analysis is that which can explain something. Okay. So what is synthetic then? Well, so it's ampliative. So it's something that adds to, adds to the yeah adds to the gives an opinion or. It gives some, it gives it some other aspect. Yeah. <clears throat> so, for example, um, something that would be analytic. Uh, let's let's think about Grace's uh, talk today. Okay, you're going to be explaining what your argument is. So, on one level, you are going to be doing that. On one level, you're going to have an analytic explanation. And that explanation, that you can have an analytic remark that's happening, and when you give your remark, this is what my work is about, I've done this, this, and this, that has led to X, Y, and Z, that has created this view, that view, and some other view, and so on and so forth. But at some point, I'm assuming, you're going to show your artwork. Now, let's look at this piece here. Um, So this, this would be a very good example of synthetic judgments or in this piece because something's happened to amplify the way in which one reads that image. Whatever that is. I'm not saying what is it. but so, so you're not using an analytic judgment to interpret what's happening there. You're not looking at that piece and going, okay, it's made of this, this, and this. This is going on, that's going on, something else is going on, and therefore we can conclude the following seven things about this, this piece. Instead, that piece taken together is evoking something, is creating something, and this, this kind of energy that it's presenting is synthetic. Do you get that? Okay. But she's also adding sensory, so that's... She's added what? Sensory, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's much more sensual, so... Yeah, yeah, but, but I'm just saying that the, the key here is to understand how synthetic operates as opposed to analytic. And so there's a philosophy, a type of philosophy called analytic philosophy. Who Those people who call themselves analytic philosophers also tend to call themselves the philosophers. Okay, so never, never be surprised if you're in the presence of uh, one of those kind of people, one of the analytic philosophers who call themselves the philosophers and you also say that you are a philosopher and they like laugh their heads off and go out of the room weeping and crying that you have sullied 
the word philosophy. Analytic philosophy is a type of empiricist philosophy that pretty much is the main form of philosophy in this country. Um, and like I said, I mean, so that's why they, they, they think that people like Derrida or Leotard or they even have issues with anyone past Hegel. Uh, they pretty much are idiots. They, they really have very serious you know, problems. Whitehead was an analytic philosopher, so it's interesting that he's now creeping back in via a continental philosophy route, because the other type of philosophy then is called continental. So you have analytic, and then you have continental. Those are the two big divides. And if you were really having to present which one you're doing, it's continental. Why? Because it's the continent of Europe. And blah, 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 blah. Okay, so, and, and mainly because you are using a synthetic logic to approach reality. And that's, that's slightly di or very different than, um, than an analytic. Okay, clear? Okay, continue. Analytic judgments say nothing in the predicates except what was actually thought already in the concept of the subject, though not so clearly nor with the same consciousness. If I say all bodies are extended, then I have not in the least amplified my concept of body have merely resolved it, since extension, though not explicitly said of the former concept prior to the judgment, nevertheless was actually thought of it. The judgment is therefore analytic. Okay, clear? It's pretty clear, right? Nothing's added, right, go on. By contrast, the proposition, some bodies are heavy, contains something in the predicate that is not actually thought in the general concept of body. It therefore augments my cognition, since it adds something to my concept must therefore be called a synthetic judgment. Yeah. Okay. We're pretty clear on this. So let us move now to C, page 17. Okay. okay. Uh, if you can read C now. Synthetic judgments require a principle other than the principle of contradiction. Okay. Very important. Now, what is the principle of contradiction? No, go on. That's good. Oh, right. I thought I wrote it down. I did it. Is that, is that sort of, sorry? Logic tends to back on itself. So, not logic, but. Uh, not quite. Not quite. Is it, is it to do like talking about bodies and can say bodies aren't heavy and then, well, they must be light then? Is that is it? Okay, it's close. Yeah. It's close, yeah. Is it the A equals A? Comes from Leibniz. Yeah, that's oh, no, when you mentioned the almost grid, there. When you mentioned the grid, uh, mm -hmm. walking on the grid, mm -hmm. uh, I know until this moment that the grid is holding my book, uh, won't let me fall down. Uh, and just to you say, oh, the grid will hold me down and not let me go. Well, you only know that it holds you down until now. You don't know if it's going to next step and you're going to fall down. So it's contradictory. The logic that makes you sure about assumptions actually contradicts the assumption that, that takes away the assumption. Mm -hmm. The way the way the most assumption was made is taken by like the statement. That was, yeah. Is that right? It's it's getting really warm. He says to know an object, I must be able to prove its possibility. Um, and the fact that you c you can prove it either by a priori or reason, but then it sort of contradicts itself because you can't know the object beforehand. So, so close. Do I try the kind of negation? Is that another way he puts it? Mm -hmm. So negation definitely comes into the picture here. What is what if something is contradictory? What is it doing? It's an antinomy. Yeah. Absolutely. What? Absolutely, it's not true. It's absolutely not true. So it's opposing it, isn't it? Okay, we're getting warmer. Th 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 okay. Think of think of Hegel and his use of contradiction. How does he set up his his totality? 
Yeah, and what is one side of the dialectic called? A thesis. thesis. And what's the other side called? Mm -hmm. and so the antithesis is the contradiction of the thesis. So what the principle of contradiction says is that for anything that exists, x, let's say, there is always already a negative x that doesn't, that will cancel it out. So that everything has all that there is and all that there's not about it. That is the principle of contradiction that Hegel then runs with. And that so does Kant. And it is an antinomy that, that Kant's been developed differently than Hegel. So, so the principle of contradiction is the principle of annihilation. That's a strong way of putting that. So if you contradict someone in philosophy terms or in mathematical terms, you are canceling out what they're saying. If you are disagreeing with them, then you are agonistic as opposed to antagonistic. <laughs> That's a whole other argument. So a contradiction means the absolute other side the absolute, it means the antithesis of the thesis, right? So that's the contradiction, that's the principle of contradiction, okay. So synthetic judgments require a principle other than the principle of contradiction. So we have our first move in a direction that's gonna take us away from what becomes known as traditional metaphysics a la Hegel. I mean, he's written before Hegel, but Hegel is gonna, gonna ignore this. Okay deal with it very differently. He's going to say that in order to make a judgment, that the first thing that Kant is going to say that you need to get a sense of is that judgments are crucial to knowledge. That in fact, one might want to even go further and say that judgments are knowledge. But that's a question mark. We can't really come there yet. That's very different to say that a judgment forms knowledge than that there is a pure thing that forms knowledge. Judgment brings lots of baggage with it. it. Brings religion and culture and bad food and a bad day and uh, you're like you know could, uh, lots of things come into your judging. It also brings in action versus a static institution. Yes. And how does it bring that in? Well, I think the, the pure knowledge is somehow in me, as it non-mediated, it's there. Yes. Uh, in the term of contemplation of whatever item of knowledge that I'm knowing. While judging means encountering something and potentially having some also other options available and evaluating using principles of reason to organize, to, 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 to distribute that and then exclude some options versus others. Um, yes, so there's some kind of flexibility or some kind of flow or some, something like that is coming into the picture here. And more importantly, this word called experience is going to start showing up. He's going to do, uh, Kant is going to have some relationship with experience for which there is very odd reactions around. And you need to be aware of this thing, experience, because when you think of your will, I don't mean the one that's not written yet. Uh, I mean the one that will keep you kind of going on despite all odds, that will. That is, that one could make an argument that it is formed from experience. That the will is an experiential animal. It's your horse, as it were. Now, so. Can continue. So we now know that some synthetic judgments operate in some way other than the Hegelian form of contradiction. Go on. Okay. How, how is it? Now we're going to move quickly forward, ever quickly forward. There are synthetic judgments a posteriori um, whose origin is empirical, but there are also synthetic judgments that are a priori certain. There's yeah, certain, and that arise from pure understanding and reason. Both, however, agree in this, that they can by no means arise solely from the principle of analysis, namely the principle of contradiction. They demand yet a completely different principle, though they always must be derived from some fundamental proposition, whichever it may be, 
in accordance with the principle of contradiction. For nothing can run counter to this principle, even though everything cannot be derived from it. I shall first classify the sympathetic judgments. Did you understand that sentence you read? So he's saying, what is he saying? <coughs> Close. Try it again. I know you're worried about your talk. I am. <laughs> Here's someone else. <laughs> okay, we'll go with someone else. Dane. Um, so, if one uses a principle of analysis to try and explain and print it, merely gives rise to a, sort of a contradiction against the point one is trying to make and that that doesn't uh, though you can do that empirically it doesn't still doesn't account for judgments which use a priori principles in a different way in order to make synthetic okay what's that weird caveat he puts in here so he says they demand yet a completely different principle, though they all, always must be derived from some fundamental principle, whichever it may be, in accordance with the principle of contradiction, for nothing can run counter to this principle, even though not everything can be derived from it. So on the one hand, he's saying something about the fact that the principle of contradiction uh, does not yield all truth, but he's saying that all truth comes from the principle of contradiction. Do you agree with that? What they didn't say. <coughs> I believe that this is where Kant becomes Kant. I mean, that where, where Kant becomes Kant in this sentence. Okay, uh, that's why you need to. That's why it's very important. Because he is differentiating a method from uh, the content of knowledge, mm -hmm. and that this is why. So to me, when I read this, uh, I got stuck uh, as the most important part is that he speaks of knowledge merely as judgment. So. so um, the principle of contradiction <coughs> before or in the previous paragraph is described as something that is self necessary. Uh, <coughs> <sorry. coughs> and right. therefore, uh, uh, it, it, it is, is opposite. This contradiction is, um, makes no sense because nothing can be non identical to itself. And therefore, by all mission, deduce analytic judgments. When it goes into um, synthetic ones, it, it, these becomes the method that then is applied to, um, to, to other kinds of judgments that are broader, mm -hmm. but one can never escape these. So it is, it's, uh, it's really a tool. It is the method of science that is... Uh, so do you get that? Or is that just like going in one eye and out the other? Do you understand? I get the sense that that doesn't quite you haven't quite hurt, it hasn't landed yet. The ship has not landed, or the plane has not landed. So you, you're on the, so if you look at a piece of art, let's look at uh, Samira's piece. You look at this piece, if you use analytic judgment to deal with it, you would never ever be able to make any sense of that piece. Okay, so that so why then does the principle of contradiction still come into play in making an analysis, in making a remark on a piece of art? How is that possible? How is it possible that, that, that somehow this principle of contradiction comes in to mean something? Even though he's saying, when you think about it, the principle of contradiction, if you took it seriously, the way, it, let's say, Hegel will do, will not produce all knowledge. Exhibit A, look at our piece of art. You cannot use analytic judgments to deal with it. However, in order to fully realize the explanation of the piece, somehow the principle of contradiction comes in. How does that happen? Is it, is it a way of sort of shortlisting it so you're precluding other things, so you to sort of focus it down a bit? Yes. That's so good. you're sort of looking at that and saying, well, it's not. It's sport, not X. It's not support. Not, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Etc. Oh, etc. Et you know. Yeah. Okay. So that's. You're, mm -hmm. Would that be? 
not really, because no. the principle of contradiction is literally annihilating that the, the is part of it. So you can't come up, so like sport is not the contradiction of art in that sense. Yeah. The contradiction of art is not art. <clears throat> you know, it's that, that famous bit, wet is not wet, not dry. Yeah, what were you saying? Maybe there's no, I don't know. He's going to say no, I have to say, and then he's going to speak. Mm -hmm. so Go on. Yes, and what, is, what does that I mean? I call Mathieu uh, <laughs> thinking, so we uh, think and come on together. But uh, Mathieu, I question. Uh, where does the principle of contradiction come in to synthetic judgment? See, it's all to do with Samira doesn't want us to talk about artwork. Let's talk about this one here. Okay. Um, now, how would one make sense of this piece? So, it's because we contradict that we cannot make sense of that piece through analysis. And, and that Let's try it differently. Of... How would you analytically address this piece? What would be an analytic would you sort of say it's eight say, foot tall and yeah, it's trees, it's flowers. Yeah, they have trees, they have flowers. Painted. Some some of them have, you know, uh, some mm -hmm. of them are like a photograph kind of thing. Yes, that would be an analytic. Well, why do you think they need it in a way that makes it like a representation? You yes. And not get it back. Dry. Right, you could say that this is subverting representational uh, notions of gardens and landscapes. Okay, that would still be an analytic mm -hmm. judgment. Okay, now, do, yes? Now give me a synthetic judgment before we go to the fourth point. How would you, how, what would be a synthetic judgment on this? So you talk about what it does to you. Okay, that's good. We're getting there. So and what does it do to you? Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it, the colours are for me are jarring and kind of, I don't know. Makes you ill. <laughs> not that far, but um, yeah, there's a. Plastic litter, 
plus the photograph. So it depicts in something that does not belong to painting as the analytic definition of painting. Mm -hmm. um, so it brings in something outside the analytic definition, mm -hmm. which yeah, is part of what this painting is. Good. Um, so if I said this painting is a painting of the inside of my brain, is that an analytic judgment or a synthetic judgment? It's an analytic judgment. Yeah. Why? Because it doesn't really bring anything different. That's right. Nothing, I, nothing is being added or subtracted to that. So I could say that that is the inside of my brain. That would be kind of an interesting comment just in and of itself. But it's not going to really do anything. And yet, it doesn't, it gives the, let's say, the audience a hook onto how to read that painting then. So titles often do that, and that is the reason, or that's a reason why a lot of artists refuse to title their work, because they don't want to do the analytic move that says, this is doing X, whatever. So a lot of times you have untitled, which is annoying. Okay, so rather than saying, this is the inside, I just want to say my own position about titles. Yeah. So rather than say, this is the inside of Johnny's brain, how would it work to create a synthetic judgment. I was thinking I can hear the birds singing, but I don't recognize them. Wow. That's what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it, it's sort of, it, it's a, you know, it's a landscape. I know it's a landscape, but it's somewhere that I don't know, so it starts me, you know, I start thinking what would, what would I feel like if I was in that landscape. Ill. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good scene. Uh-huh. Yeah. Could be like there are no people left. But there is another. That's you know, depressing. <laughs> <laughs> there is something else that we need. Well, it looks a bit like after it kind of. A very nice one. Looks like after a Holocaust? Well, you know, very nice. It's a polite one, of course. But I believe that there is something else we need to consider when we in this distinction between analytic and synthetic judgment, which is how Kant uses a priori and posteriori. Okay. Because otherwise, we get nowhere. Uh, exactly. So. Um, a priori, as in, it is almost another way of describing an analogy. But there is something else to it. A priori is what one knows or can know without having to get out of prison. Did you hear that? While synthetic, in the first um, uh, example, goes out of prison into experience, organizing all the aura, where data comes back and has a synthesis a piece of knowledge as we know it. Um, so it is something else. And in, in this um, first uh, chapter of the Prodocomena, it kind of speaks of having to recur to intuition for the synthesis. Mm -hmm. So an intuition is what belongs to organizational experience. Physical, the body, the senses. Okay, are you following? So, what we're going to the takeaway so far that I want you to try and get a sense of is that there are two types of judgments, analytic and synthetic. That's the first thing you just have to just think about. The analytic judgment requires relying on a form of reason that will make it make sense, and that form of reason is wholly contained within itself. And hence, the principle of contradiction is part of that. I think the way you just described that is quite, um, it's quite fine, it's quite, it, it makes a lot of sense. Because in fact, the notion of synthetic unity then, or the, so, sorry, synthetic uh, reason, or synthetic judgment, sorry, synthetic judgment requires a move that brings in other pieces to make it make sense. Those pieces could be that in in making these, you know, this way, this kind of statement about how something exists, X, Y, Z, and that you can say, oh yeah, I can see how that happens. So I'm going to go back again. If I say that that is the inside of my brain. Is it analytic or synthetic? <coughs> Why? Uh, 
because you're just explaining what the picture is. You're just but for you to understand that it is the inside of my brain, for you to go, aha, uh -huh, yeah, I can see that. What do you need to do in order to understand that that is, in fact, an image of the inside of my brain? What do you need to know? What, what, what's the, what do you have to know? You have to know your reason behind it. But you can never know my reason behind it. You can never know the intention of the artist's reason behind it. No, but if you give an explanation, if you say... But if I just say, that's the title, Inside of Johnny's Brain, how would you make sense of that? How would you say, or would you just go, oh, no, it's ridiculous, I'm not making sense of it. One second, Carla. Okay. <laughs> uh, how would you make sense of that? trying to just state it otherwise, maybe that was a cruel and rotten thing to do, and I'm really sorry, but I'm trying to have you really understand how something goes outside of a reason as we would know it as a, as a contradictory form of logic, a principle operating on the principle of contradiction, in order to still be able to make sense of something. So, you can use an analytic move. Actually, I feel like I should maybe have a homework assignment. You walk around, you look at something, look at, look at a work and, and, and its relationship to its title and see whether or not we're dealing with an analytic or a synthetic form of judgment. And that, that's always usually of synthetic because we, we are taking in kind of experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the analytic would be an element of Yes. It would be the dictionary. Yes. It would be what? A picture the dictionary. The dictionary. The dictionary or dictionary? Dictionary. Dictionary, okay, right. Mm -hmm. Yes, sort of, because we know that analysis is a little bit more sophisticated than dictionary. You know what I mean? When you see a picture in the dictionary, okay. the captain usually describes the picture. Right. In that aspect. Every piece of art would be synthetic. Yes. You know when you give the title of the piece and when you publish your book, let's say somewhere, and it says uh, you give a title, sometimes ridiculous, boo boo boo, and there's a picture of a penis and it's called boo 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 boo. So you know straight away that you make sense out of it somewhere in your head. If that's a synthetic, or would you do the digital photography? That's the other half. That's that comes in as a second part of the description that comes in in a way that would be coming in. So you, so your images a penis, yes, and then it's called boo boo boo, okay? Now, in order to make sense then, in order to make sense of that, yeah. you're suggesting that that would be a synthetic judgment, give just that little bit of information. Image, boo boo boo. Is that what you're saying? Well, as a viewer, not yeah. as a viewer. As, as a yeah. viewer, as an artist, as yeah. whatever, as how one makes sense of that other than it just being a representational image of a penis. Because it actually, you're saying boo, boo, boo. That's actually saying something a little bit more than that, right? And it's allowing a, a different relationship to take place that, that creates uh, more of an energy, more of a dynamic to the piece. So you're adding to it, and that allows it to expand, basically. Right. And now, why is it called a posteriori? Because that's an a posteriori judgment. What does that mean, a posteriori? It's after. It's after. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. No? Okay. Any more? What do you think about then, because you were making a claim, but you could make a claim about this being analytics, the inside of my brain. 
but then you have to build the argument of how is it actually analytic? How is it working as analytic? Yeah, I mean, I I agree with what Jacob was saying, and that mm -hmm. when you put the state of the art work, basically the information we just make and support by two digital code or whatever, then that's sort of the analytic part of it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's what Oscar was also saying. It's kind of like a definition. And we'll but that's not good enough. You know that's not good enough because obviously that's not really an analyzing it. You're right. That, that no, it's no, just no. It, it involves more, as in, you know, if, if I, I don't know, when, when, let's say, you talk to a painter and they explain their painting, and they explain their painting, Yes. so they, there is an element, they, when they say, oh, I felt sad, and let's yeah. say, that's still analytical, that's still and analytical. It's because it's still that explanation of mm -hmm. what is it. That's right. And Good. I believe it's a bit more But you, that. yeah, but as a, let's say, they explain the painting, so they talk, like, not talk about it, they explain it. And I was sad that my boyfriend broke up with me, I, I painted a huge tree. Uh, a disturbing tree. A disturbing tree, tree. <laughs> with wire on top, and I made this painting erotic. But, <laughs> uh, but anyway, and, and, you know, there's explanation to it. Um, but you listening to the explanation because you're experiencing the explanation and you're seeing the painting, you develop synthetical judgment toward, towards the painting, don't you? Post that's possible, yes. That's that post priori judgment towards it. But and not in this sort of staging, not like no, there's a discussion and then there's a. No, because. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, okay, right? yes, that's right. I think mm -hmm. that. I probably is not. I think this would be. Clarifying better because this could, I see I see your example falling on both sides. Both mm -hmm. are really awesome a lot of earlier said that it's very important that the, the, the judgment in question is a predicate. So mm -hmm. we are predicating that are claiming something of something else, mm -hmm. um, you know, P of uh, Q or something like that, or, or mm -hmm. the basic of it, it would be A is A mm -hmm. or A is not A. So as long as we remain within the, 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 some claim. Well, whatever we, we are uh, saying of the subject is contained in the subject definition, then we are in an analytic environment. The judgment is analytic. And, and <coughs> it is a priori, because it can happen. It, 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 a priori and posteriori are not chronological or logical. So I can have the information and the knowledge I'm getting out of it without getting out of my brain, without getting out of reason. I can mm -hmm. only function in this abstract environment. And that's the analytic one. Then there is the judgment of experience, the first one, which is synthetic in terms of uses whatever abstract principle from reason and then organizes data from experience. So it opens it up and there is something more that A or if this it is A, A is hot. Mm -hmm. And I need to touch it to know it is hot. So I go through the, the essential, the body, and all of that. And this, so this would be a posteriori. It's something that logically needs external data to, to make sense. Mm -hmm. The problem that Kant finds is that how can I have a priori synthetic judgment? Judgment that put together concepts in, in, in reason without getting out of this. It somehow it doesn't question the fact that when I touch it, I think it, that's a given. Mm -hmm. Um, and is it, it's not lost. No, it's not even that. Just doesn't. It's not a question for him. Right? It, it, it's somehow self-evident that you know, if, if I touch this and this is hot, it burns me. If you hit me with a hammer, it's painful. That's not what he's concerned about. What's concerned about? That's what concern is concerned about. That's a different issue. Um, his, his problem is how how does a judgment stay together? Uh, and along which you know, what's what what is the logic or the method? And so the, the question that he brings up at the end of this, with the first chapter of this introduction we're looking at now is how is it possible to have judgments that are synthetic, are bringing together things that were not implicit in the definition of what we're talking about, but are a priori, are just in the reason, are not going out mm -hmm. and using the body. Because the body, in it, it's to, it seems to me, at least from what I've read so far, is reliable in itself. What, what comes from the body is to be trusted in self 
So when you are describing the paint, uh, I would say that analytic judgment is that <coughs> a painting is something that is not a paint. Mm -hmm. If I say a painting is something that is framed, it's already synthetic. Because I need to have the experience of having seen painted, framed paintings. Okay. And yeah, then, I can see that. So yeah, that, I can then see that. The, 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 the concept of painting can be sophisticated to the point that painting frame is a painting. It depends on where we are setting the first step. Okay. What I'd like to do is to, uh, I think we're going to close this off so that Grace can go into a different headspace and prepare for her talk in 10 minutes. Um, but what I would like you to think about for next week is this relationship of synthetic judgment to the will. Like where does, why is the will a part of synthetic judgment and not part of analytic judgment? And then the next question is, how come the will then becomes the fundamental a priori synthetic unity to all knowledge in Kant? And therefore in your own work. We'll see how this will resonate. So the first one is, think about why the will is a part of synthetic rather than analytic reason. And the second one is, why do you think, given that, or even irrespective of that, that synthetic reason, become, the will as an a priori synthetic unity is considered by Kant one of the, the categorical imperatives that must create the foundation and the moving forward of knowledge. Kant puts will at the base of knowledge. Hegel puts concept at the base of knowledge. Marx puts history at the base of knowledge. Kant's move is to put the will there. And, and hence he feeds very nicely into all forms of art. But we were going to take that and play with that a little bit more. Okay, now,